When you come visit the locks in Seattle, you might be curious about a couple of things. One is the name Hiram M. Chittenden, and the other is the castle emblem of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. You might be asking yourself, who is this guy Chittenden, and what does the Army have to do with the locks? I'm Katie McGilvery, and I work for the Corps. We actually built the locks in the Lake Washington Ship Canal 100 years ago, and we still run them today. As part of our centennial, we're producing a series of short films to help answer questions like these. In this episode, you will learn about the Corps' role here, and you'll meet the great-grandchildren of the amazing man the locks are named after. Please join us for this special episode about Hiram M. Chittenden and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The Army Corps of Engineers, when, when you think of the Lake Washington Ship Canal, think of their history too, because especially after the 1812 war with England, the nation became a little bit frightened, you know, that they could have the White House could be burned down again. So they started to invest more money in protecting the shorelines, building lighthouses, improving waterways, and that was an important predecessor to the building of the Lake Washington Ship Canal. The Corps of Engineers goes all the way back to General George Washington. At the time he was formulating his Continental Army, he decided it was important to have an engineer along. I guess for obvious reasons of scoping out military roads and developing ways of, of crossing water. And then throughout the following decades, the Corps developed in response to westward expansion. As the interior parts of the country were settled, there was a lot of products that needed to be shipped from the interior to the east coast. And obviously rivers were the best way of doing that. So the Corps was asked to play a role in navigation, to keep those waterways open, doing river maintenance, snag removal, dredging, dam building, some levee construction, and flood risk management. So that's how the Corps ended up having a big role in the Pacific Northwest and creating its signature project here at the Chittenden Locks. Hiram Chittenden was a pivotal figure in the history of the Corps of Engineers and one of less than a handful of the most important engineers that shaped the Corps from east to west. Hiram Martin Chittenden is a really interesting individual. He graduated from the military academy in the class of 1884, and he had numerous military assignments throughout his life. He was also a historian, and his literary and historical works were really tied to his engineering works. All of his army assignments led to the publication of either a book or some article about the specific region where he was working. His first stint from 1891 to 1893 was in Yellowstone. He published a book in 1895 on Yellowstone National Park, which is a definitive work. He had another military tour in St. Louis, and he ended up writing a book on the history of fur trading in the American West, which is another definitive three-volume set. Chittenden really sort of was a Renaissance man. I mean, he was this guy who had this bigger picture of the world. And he arrives in Seattle in 1906, at a time when we're still trying to figure out where exactly to put the canal, what sort of canal it would be, how we're gonna fund it. And he brings the city together. He rallies people around to support the idea of the North Canal. The big challenge of the idea of the canal is that Lake Washington was nine feet higher than Lake Union. And so you had two choices. You either build two set of locks, one lock that would bring boats up to the level of Lake Union, which is a little bit above sea level, and then another that would bring boats up to the level of Lake Washington. Chittenden says, no, we need one set of locks. And what we need to do is make Salmon Bay Lake Union and Lake Washington at the same elevation. And in fact, people had been wanting to lower Lake Washington for 50, 60 years because Lake Washington, by flowing out through the Black River, led to flooding in the Duwamish River Valley. 
If you could stop Lake Washington going into the Duwamish, you wouldn't have flooding there. And so he solves a second part of the equation. And in addition, the other big thing is he gets federal funding. Never before had the government agreed to pay for the project. And that's what Chittenden brings, is the design and the funding and the unity of the city. The construction of the locks was a massive undertaking because the Corps was already uh, building the Panama Canal and the lock systems there. So mm -hmm. they took on this other big project about at the same time and it was a massive undertaking. There were about 300 men working right here at the locks. All the cement was mixed right here at the locks of 15 men had to man the big cement mixers and there were rail lines that went down hauling the material back and forth into the locks and so forth. And then at the same time this was going on, uh, the Corps was supervising the dredging of the canal itself and that included, of course, digging the Fremont and Mott Lake cuts. They had massive steam shovels and water cannons and they were blasting through the earth and uh, removed overall and with the whole project somewhere around four million cubic yards of dirt. The forgotten engineer in all of this is James Cavanaugh, who takes over the job from Chittenden. Chittenden retires in 1909 for health reasons and Cavanaugh in 1911 takes over. He, like Chittenden, had been a West Point graduate. Uh, he actually graduated first in his class. And he pushes it all through. He's the one who's, you see his name on all of the paperwork. Chittenden's the designer, the funder. Cavanaugh was the builder. July 4th, 1917 is the grand opening of the system. The papers estimate that something like third or half of the city watched it in one form or another. And the big event was this great boat parade led by the Roosevelt. This was the boat that had taken Admiral Peary up to the North Pole, was now here to lead a parade from the locks into Lake Union and from Lake Union down to Leshy. Chittenden unfortunately did not attend the 1917 ceremonies because he was on the verge of death. Had to watch it from his home on North Broadway. So he looked down over the lake. He could see the fireworks and hear all of the noise and all that, but he wasn't able to be there. Chittenden, uh, one of the brilliant, effective characters in the history of Seattle. Hi. Oh, good morning. How are you? Welcome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mark. This is Cheryl, my sister. Today, it was a fun day. I had the privilege of meeting the great-grandchildren of Hiram Chittenden. And our first stop on the tour today was here at the administration building, where we walked upstairs to look at the collection of original drawings that were prepared for the construction of the locks. As you can see, it's a very thoughtful design, and your great-grandfather was responsible for the placement of all of these structures. Then we walked over to the machine shop where we looked at some of the tools and mechanical devices that have been used to repair and maintain the locks. Yes, isn't that amazing? Size of the what? The wrench collection. Oh, yeah. Very interesting feature was going upstairs to look at the set of what we call patterns, these wooden molds that were created to cast the original metal components of the locks. The creation of the patterns themselves required a lot of artistic and engineering ability. This is the mold that was created to cast some of the bronze and other features uh, with the core castle insignia. Let's go into the control tower. Then we walked to the newer control tower. We're all pushing the buttons. <laughs> the control tower was built in 1969. Come on in. 
So we were able to go upstairs and look at the extensive banks of instruments and hear an explanation of how that is the ground control for everything that happens at the locks. Right. Next, we moved over to have a look at the spillway itself and talked a little bit about the series of gates that hold back water. These are a very standardized gate now that was developed by pretty much by the Corps in the 1930s. And then we moved over to look a little more closely at the fish passage aspects. I've been down here when it's been teeming with yeah, fish. Yeah, and it's, it's a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. I think he's a steelhead. Steelhead. Didn't see much today. This is not the time of year to see too many fish, but that's one of the most famous activities at the locks. Next, we walked up toward what is known today as the Kavanaugh House. It is today used at, primarily as the residence for the Seattle District Commander. This actually was the very first structure built on this site, before the locks. We also walked around and looked at some of the landscape features, which are really the legacy of Carl English. Here you can see a commemorative plaque that honors Carl English. Carl, as you probably know, is responsible for the beautiful gardens we have here at the locks. It's such a lush garden landscape and has become one of Seattle's favorite parks, really one of Seattle's personal backyards. A uh, place of retreat and kind of quiet reflection in a really pretty busy urban environment. I think you can see that the heritage of your great-grandfather is here in this very sensitive layout. Thinking about our tour today and what if Hiram Chittenden were along in our tour today? What would he see? What would he think? First of all, I think he'd be struck by the survival of most all of the original buildings and concepts that he laid out. Although he may not be surprised because I think he intended these things to, to last. There was durability and permanence in his vision from the beginning. I think he would be struck by the contributions of Carl English and to see how the basics of engineering have been softened by this very lush and very beautiful landscape. Uh, I think he would be amazed at the popularity of the site as a park, as a destination for retreat and recreation. He probably would not have expected that, but I think he'd be quite proud of the things that have lasted from his lifetime and how meaningful they have become to the city of Seattle and beyond.